I'm David Feldman. I'm the uh, director of the Pears Institute for the study of anti-Semitism. And, uh, and it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you uh, this evening. And it's a, 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 a particular pleasure to be welcoming you to this particular event, Histories of Prejudice Persecuting Others. Um, and that's because the, uh, at the occasion for, for um, of the event, you know, the um, stimulus for the event really is to mark the publication um, of this book, Another Darkness, Another Dawn, A History of Gypsies, Roma and Travellers by, by Becky Taylor. Becky, um, I'm going to take all the credit for everything which is good in this book, which is of course all of it, because, uh, because, uh, because once upon a time, Becky studied for her PhD under my supervision, so it's I mean, it's really my book, I like, yeah, and, 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 and it's a very wonderful <laughs> book too. Um, yeah, I've never had any original thoughts of my own. <laughs> I, I think you're too modest. <laughs> um, more seriously, um, another darkness, another dawn, is a work both of. Um, original research and of synthesis. It's a history of the gypsies, Roma, and travellers with a breathtaking scope going from the medieval period down to the present from the Balkans across Western Europe. The overarching lesson of the book, I think, is that this is a history not to be siphoned off or isolated, as it sometimes is, as the history of a marginal minority. Certainly it is the history of a minority, but one whose history both develops in interaction with the majority society and which also reflects upon that society or those societies. And you're all very welcome um, after... Um, um, after this evening's talks and discussion to um, a reception just over the road in the, Claw, in the Claw building where you will be able to buy a copy of the book for yourself at a 20% discount. So, uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, and free wine. I mean, is this an offer you could possibly refuse? I, uh, I think not. One of the main ways, Becky argues, in which the history of gypsies, Roma, and travellers reflects on mainstream society, of course, is through the history of persecution. And it is the history of persecution that stimulated the plan for this evening's event. And the question which sprang to my mind was, what happens when we place the history of persecuted minorities or the histories of persecuted minorities alongside each other. Historically, did these minorities perceive that they had anything in common, even their persecution? Was there ever, so to speak, a rainbow coalition, a historical rainbow coalition of the excluded? Or did the differences between these groups surface and dominate? Do we need to recover uncomfortable divisions and hostilities between various outsider groups, the history of Jewish or traveler homophobia, for example, or the way in which class distinctions interact with these different other exclusions. Perhaps, rather than looking for a spontaneous solidarity among the oppressed, born of the false expectation that somehow oppression ennobles and enlightens its victims, we might look elsewhere for commonalities and comparisons. Perhaps these, these commonalities and comparisons can be found in the subjective responses within different groups to oppression and the dynamics of these different responses. It's possible that we'll find elements of complicity, of resistance, of denial, and of the subjectivity of victimhood across different groups. Perhaps if we focus on these categories, we might be able to construct a history 
that cuts across the experience of, of different persecuted minorities and draws these histories together in ways that just might, just might, prefigure a greater political dialogue and solidarity in the present. Well, to, to develop these themes, perhaps, and to raise other questions, certainly, um, I'd like to introduce um, our panel this evening. Our first speaker will be Becky Taylor, the author of Another Darkness, Another Dawn. Um, and uh, I mean, Becky is at present a welcome research fellow in the Department of History, Classics, and Archaeology and at the Pears Institute at Birkbeck. Um, Becky will be followed by Matt Cook. Matt teaches History and Gender Studies here at Birkbeck and has just published Queer Domesticities, Homosexuality and Home Life in 20th Century London. And thirdly, we'll hear from Jessica Reinisch. Jessica teaches modern European history and German history. I'm here at Birkbeck. A year ago, she published a book entitled Perils of Peace, Public Health, uh, the Public Health Crisis in Occupied Germany, and is, uh, um, is currently leading um, a major research project on um, the reluctant internationalists, a history of public health and international organizations movements and experts in 20th century Europe. Hello, thanks for but coming this evening, all... especially on such a lovely evening too. Um, when I'm asked what kind of history I research, I normally semi-jokingly say I look at unpopular people and their relationship with the state and wider society. Not as well as gypsies and travellers, um, I've done work looking at uh, migrants, poor, poor people, refugees, problem families. Um, and while it's kind of a slightly facetious way of doing it, um, it does capture something of the work that I do, but I also sort of flattens it and doesn't really give it justice, because what actually interests me is not only the similarities between the ways in which mainstream society treats different groups it sees as sitting on its margins, but also, and crucially, I think, the differences. It's really easy to label what we see both today and in history as racism or prejudice, but such labels, I think, do nothing to reveal the processes by which some people are marginalised and stigmatised and not others, and how this process happens in some <coughs> places and times and not others. For me, much of the work of a historian lies in uncovering and thinking about those differences and what they might mean, both for the groups I'm studying and what they reveal about mainstream society too. So consequently, much of the existing and popular history which surrounds gypsies, Roma and travellers is, for me, slightly unsatisfactory. Either they're not really granted a history and they're seen as marginal to the concerns of the mainstream or timeless and untouched by history, or often when a history is constructed, it's one of unending persecution and for kind of understandable political reasons, but again, as a historian, it's not very satisfactory. And to sort of paraphrase this very crudely, this kind of history unproblematically ties up the edicts and persecutions of the 16th and 17th centuries, when simply being a gypsy could result in mutilation, banishment or execution. Um, with the genocidal attempts to the, uh, by the Nazis and then move seamlessly on to current waves of harassment, whether it's the actions of, say, Sarkozy and deportations from France or the eviction of British gypsy and traveller families from places like Dale Farm today. And I'm not arguing that those things did not happen, nor that they are unimportant. Clearly they are. Simply they don't tell us the historian, tell us the whole story. As a historian, what I want to know also is what happens in between those events. They are, if you like, those big things. They're the noise of gypsy traveller history. The big events, the things which leave paper trails. Correspondence, laws, newspaper articles, personal accounts. The very stuff that we as historians rely on. But they don't account for many things. If we're simply to believe the noise of those paper trails, we would believe that by the end of the 18th century, gypsies in Europe had disappeared, killed or exiled, or driven to hide their identity, settle down or assimilate into the wider population. All those things did happen. But actually, the other reality is that although often living on the margins of society, by the end of, 18th, by the, end of the 18th century, gypsies had established themselves in every country across Europe. Similarly, if we think for a moment about the Second World War, a time which saw the incarceration of Roma and Sinti alongside Jews and homosexuals in concentration and death camps, it's very easy to draw together a narrative which shows how Nazis systematically positioned all these groups as subhuman and worthy of extermination. 
We can also fit such an account into a more general understanding of long-standing negative stereotypes held about Roma, Sinti and other gypsy groups across Europe from the time of their documented arrival in the 15th century. And yet, once again, such a history would only give us part of the answer. It does not provide us with an explanation which opens out any understanding of the differences in treatment between them and Jews and homosexuals, nor between and within different national groups of Roma, Gypsies and Sinti. It does not, for example, explain to us why over 95% of Croatian Roma, for example, were exterminated during the war, but while those in France were interned quite systematically across the whole, whole country, but only those in the Nord département were the ones who were de de deported to Auschwitz. It also wouldn't explain to us why Romanian Roma were just deported to the east of the country and into the Ukraine, but not sent to the camps, nor indeed why British gypsies fought on both the home and on the home front in an active service, but we don't know how many because the state didn't keep separate records for them. It didn't see them as being a separate group at all. So what I argue, both in this book and in my work more generally, is that it's vital to understand and explore the silence, if we might think about it, alongside the noise that we find in the archives, the subtlety and differences between places and times, and the treatment of different marginalised groups, if we're to truly understand how persecution and prejudice operates and is expressed. Part of this, I think, as a historian, is understanding the limitations of the material with which we work. It's really easy, for example, to construct a history of the growing number of councils passing bylaws against tents, vans and sheds from the 19th century onwards. And there's correspondence between local authorities and central government, backed up with letters by local residents complaining of the nuisance they bring. And there's a growing number, and there's the actual growing number of bylaws themselves. But at the same time, it's easy to ignore the number of places which did not pass bylaws, which was in fact the majority of the country. This absence, this silence in the archives is just as important. In a country like Britain in particular, which is particularly rich, both in survival rate and geographical com comprehensiveness of its records, the absence of such material is itself telling. Even taking into account lost or destroyed records, we need to accept that for vast swathes of time from their arrival in the 16th century up to at least the later 19th century and across much of the country, their presence did not generate records. And this might lead us to reasonably suppose that an important part of the history of gypsies, Roma and travellers was the, the very stuff of everyday life that does not get recorded, making a living, finding somewhere to live, maintaining a family and community networks. I'm not saying they did not experience being moved on, nor they did not experience unjust treatment at the hands of the authorities. Those things clearly did happen. But we need to understand their history of oppression within a context in which gypsies, Roma and travellers were able to carve out what was often livable lives for themselves. And I think such an approach is important because it allows us as historians to ask different questions, to ask how it was that such communities were able to survive despite the laws against them. This leads us into being able to explore interesting questions, if you're a his historian, over the limitations of the state, for example, at different places in, in history and at different times. And in doing this, we're opening up the door to setting the history of gypsies and travellers alongside and within the history of wider society, rather than seeing them as separate from the historical processes which were affecting the rest of the world, urbanisation, the expansion of government and bureaucracies, m migration and empire, and the rise of nation-states and nationalism, to give us a few examples, and I draw these out in the book. And this allows us to answer those questions around the experiences of different gypsies in different countries and actually leads us to the con conclusion that they experienced history in the same way that everybody experienced history. They're not separate from it, but they're affected by the same things that affects everyone else. And I think, although that's a very obvious point, it's also a really important one because it's something they've been systematically sidelined from. And I think also, and crucially, by accepting that gypsies and travellers were able to survive, to establish themselves as part of European society and develop specific musical and cultural traditions, we're no longer consigning them simply to a history of unending victimhood where they have no agency. Rather, we're able to acknowledge and consider the processes by which they were able to construct an, a culture and identity of their own. So if one way in which we might want to set our understanding of the history of gypsies is within a narrative, within sort of the unpacking of the narrative of unrelenting and remorseless persecution. Another useful way of opening up new understandings of their history is by positioning their experiences alongside those of other marginal groups, which is why I think tonight is particularly interesting. And we don't have much time to look at this in depth here, but I'm just going to use one quick example to draw out how it might be useful to understand how differences between marginalised groups played out and in relation to their in 
in, in relation to their wider relationship with society and how crucial it is to forming historical experiences. So if we take Britain in the post-war period, which I've chosen because I think it's something that people are probably most familiar with, a time of growing pros prosperity, social and cultural change alongside social and economic mobility. It's also, of course, a time of growing ethnic diversity as immigration from the new Commonwealth and parts of Europe added to more established mi migrations from Ireland. We can look back now and see how the late 1960s was a critical moment as ideas of assimilation and the expectation that new arrivals would simply fit into British culture moved towards understanding that Britain was becoming changed and challenged as a result of its new populations. And as a result, multiculturalist ideas, although obviously problematic in many levels, began to emerge, which aimed to give space and expression to those different cultures. And also it's a time of greater social pl pl plurality, pl plurality more generally, the Abortions Act, the decriminalisation of homosexuality, again, although both problematic in their own ways, it did shift, it did signal a shift in the direction of mainstream attitudes. How then did gypsies and travellers, arguably Britain's longest established minority population, fare in this new context? We might expect that within this context of greater social fluidity and apparent tolerance, along with other minority populations, the last decade of the 20th century could have seen an improvement in their legal and social standing in relation to the wider population. In fact, if it were possible, what we see is the opposite, a significant decline in their status, so that by the time of the 2000 and, uh, 2005 Maury poll, gypsies and travellers were the population group that the general British public was most likely to feel, it is put kindly, negatively towards. Even more so, in fact, than asylum seekers and refugees. Understanding how this became the case is not only important for gypsies and travellers themselves, it's also crucial for revealing how particular process, processes can come together in an apparently liberal democratic state to vilify and further stigmatise an already marginal group. Here we both need to understand the changing material conditions of the period and the ways in which these interacted with stereotypes in particular ways. Partly for brevity's sake, but also because I suspect I really don't have to labour this point, we all, have we all have stereotypical images of gypsies in our heads. Either the real gypsies, who live in a romantic bow-top caravan, pulled up on a common with horses grazing, probably someone making pegs, I think we all have that kind of picture in our head. Um, or the thieving, violet, dirty tinker with their flash caravan and pile of scrap, who turns up, causes a mess and a problem. Okay. While these stereotypes do have a long historical pedigree, which kind of changes a bit over time, but broadly remain consistent, in the late 20th century, they acquired a particular toxicity. Gypsies and travellers had managed to construct what we might think of as everyday, fairly livable lives over the course of 19th and early 20th century. It was largely because there was enough physical space for them to do so. There was enough seasonal and casual work alongside hawking and dealing, not only to make a living, but crucially, for people to see that there was an economic reason and benefit for gypsies and travellers to be in a particular area at a particular time. All of these factors changed after the Second World War, not all at the same time, but certainly coming together so that by the 1980s, they had all coalesced. The Town and Country Planning Act and massive house building programme profoundly shaped post-war Britain, not only through building on peri-urban and derelict areas which had long been stopping places for gypsy travellers. You know, there's more than one story of gypsy travellers turning up to a place that they'd turned, they'd pulled on for years, uh, only to find a council estate uh, built where they always used to be, even perhaps with a gypsy lane being one of the names of it, but suddenly somehow being consigned as being outsiders and the problem. But also, it wasn't just the physical building, but also the planning process which designated all the land for particular purposes. Industry, residential development, greenbelt, none of it for caravans. So fewer places to stop. Something which was initially hidden by increased motorisation of gypsies and travellers, who no longer needed to move frequently for grazing and were able to travel further in search of work. But this meant that when gypsies and travellers arrived, they stayed in one place for longer. And as the number of stopping places reduced, more people pulled on to the remaining ones. At the same time, hawking and small-scale scale, door-to-door selling and seasonal agriculture and other casual work began to reduce importance for gypsies and travellers. More moved into activities like scrap dealing, tarmacking, lopping and topping. All these brought in more money than hawking, but meant fewer face-to-face -face <coughs> transactions, while also often necessitating accumulating piles of scrap or waste material. So, fewer sites more people staying on them, staying longer, and seen as being increasingly unsightly. In addition to this, gypsies and travellers modernised alongside the rest of society, using petrol generators to provide electricity, buying newer style, more spacious and warmer trailers, using vehicles instead of horses, cooking on gas rather than open fire. 
By doing so, by not conforming to settled society's image of them as a secret people living in the manner of the of their great-grandparents, the iconic romanticised images of gypsies became the rod with which their back was consistently beaten. Failing to conform to romantic expectations, the stereotypes most often deployed by the popular press and by politicians were the negative ones relating to antisocial behaviour and a failure to conform to the standards of normal society. When we add into this mix the meteoric rise of house owning from the 1970s and Britain's particular obsession with the value of one's property, the visceral response of people to the arrival of gypsies and travellers in their area, or the proposal to build an official site, becomes much more explicable. And gypsies and travellers came into all of this with at least one hand tied behind their backs, coming from a still largely oral tradition where formal literacy skills were limited and where organising before the existence of mobile phones and the internet was a logistical almost impossibility, they were unable to develop the same community infrastructures and responses which other minority ethnic populations were able to develop from the 1960s in order to navigate their, their way in British society and the opportunities offered by uh, the structures of what was becoming a multicultural Britain. The Gypsy Council did emerge from the crises of the 1960s, but it often struggled with maintaining a coherent organisational structure and being seen as truly representative of the very disparate Gypsy traveller communities that we have in Britain. So just quickly to conclude, and I hope we can carry on this conversation afterwards because I'm paraphrasing massively here. What does all this tell us? That prejudice is located, operates and is expressed in different ways and at different times. And by understanding how it is mobilised within a particular society at a particular time, we can get behind flat descriptions and instead reveal exactly the processes by which societies generate and maintain day-to-day -day and institutionalised prejudice. Such an understanding, then, also allows us to think seriously about how it might be challenged. And of course, I would argue, this shows us that history is not a luxury, but is rather vital for shedding light on contemporary Britain. To be part of this event celebrating um, Becky's wonderful book, I'm now going to endeavour to put up a couple of slides. Okay, I wanted to start with this. Um, this is an extract from uh, Michael Schofield's Society and the Homosexual from 1952. Um, he was one of the early, an early um, sociologist looking at homosexual life um, in London. And what he does here with this particular case study is idealise a particular um, um, homosexual couple who I've imagined look a bit like the people on the right. It wasn't actually an illustrated book. This is what I'm picturing. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, see, you'll see that these guys are devoted to each other. They're deeply domestic. Um, they um, made their home like young newlyweds. They're not too physically affectionate with each other, which might be a bit grim, um, but they are in complete emotional harmony, um, and they don't socialise too much um, out of their um, um, central London flat, but they are content to entertain their gay and straight friends um, at home. Um, they're both professionals. They're both solidly middle class. Um, and this is really the beginnings of the image of the homosexual that um, a growing reformist literature was imagining might gain some acceptability um, um, in the post-war um, British in post-war British society. And it was part of a whole range of literature, an upsurge of literature in the 1950s, in sociology, in film, in literature, in, as in parts of the press that was beginning to think about the ways in which the respectable middle-class homosexual um, might um, become a respectable legal citizen. One of the ways in which these, this figure and couple is touted is by what they are not. And this is where the issue of prejudice becomes really clear. Because what um, the cultured, respectable homosexual might meet if he descends to the queer bar level is something really quite different. He might have some temporary partners and some short-lived happiness in, from these bars, but he'll also have to be able to hold his own in a vicious, jealous, backbiting society where no affair is sacred and every effort will be made to hinder his search for happiness. These, pe these people who are good-mannered, polite and have some respect for the ethics and other moral laws of society are quite different from the implicitly here, explicitly elsewhere, working class, queers and queens. And in a range of literature, um, we get these two figures, the respectable homosexual 
and the bitchy, effeminate, working class queer, or else the masculine, opportunistic, greedy, blackmailing um, working class um, homo um, invert. So in The Heart in Exile, these figures are contrasted. Peter Wildblood was imprisoned for homosexual activity. He was a journalist um, and wrote this plea for a change in the law, partly by um, claiming that it was this particular class of homosexuals who could be good, upright citizens in opposition to this um, lower, um, rather degenerate grouping. Victim, the landmark film, a wonderful film actually, but in which the um, uh, middle class barrister Melville Farr is the victim of the working class blackmailer and queer. Um, and this absolutely runs through the testimony offered to the Wolfenden Report. The two, the three homosexuals that appeared before the Wolfenden Commission, which was investigating the legal situation um, in the UK, um, were all middle class. Um, the working class, um, wor the wor working class men weren't interviewed. Um, and his recommendations for legalisation absolutely pivoted on ideas of respectability and access to private space. So when the law finally changed in 67, it was two men in private who could um, um, enjoy sexual relations with each other without being beyond the law, which might sound very reasonable, except when you look at the figures of the numbers of people who actually had access to private space, and also the incredibly narrow way in which privacy was defined um, in, um, under that legislation. It excluded hotel rooms, for example. Um, and so what we're getting is a legal change which enshrines this respectable middle-class couple and quite explicitly excludes um, working-class uh, men. And in fact, in oral history testimonies and in the diaries of Joe Wharton and elsewhere, um, men very explicitly say this. They say, well, the change in the law was irrelevant to me because I didn't have this space and this was not how I could conduct my romantic and sexual relations. Um, and this gets um, underscored in the press too. So alongside this reformist literature in the 50s, you also get um, some really vicious um, press coverage. And the absolutely classic dynamic that keeps emerging in this coverage is of the middle class victim, homosexual victim, and the working class or black um, um, avaricious blackmailing um, queer. This is a pattern that gets repeated again and again. So in 1955, there's an army captain blackmailed um, by a Trinidadian immigrant. A year later, um, there's a company director um, all over the newspaper, all over the, the popular press, um, being blackmailed by a working class Soho boxer. Um, and this is the kind of dynamic that plays out again and again. And one of the impetuses behind the change in the law is the protection of these respectable middle class men against these working class um, and Afro-Caribbean um, queers. Often seen to be opportunistic, um, not real, really homosexual, taking advantage and so on. And this has a history too, as Becky was saying in, in relation to the Roma um, and, and traveling um, communities. So when you track back to the late 19th century, you see emerging sexology absolutely making connections between homelessness and homosexuality. The idea of this undomesticated figure who can't be incorporated um, into um, respectable life. So when Simeon Solomon, the Jewish um, painter, um, is arrested and prosecuted for homosexual offenses in the 1860s and lives the remainder of his life um, as a homeless uh, man, also um, in the workhouse at St. Giles, at St. Giles. Ma was it Maryland? <laughs> what happens in commentary there, amongst his friends and elsewhere, is this triangulated um, 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 relationship between queer life, the wandering Jew, and the homeless. And this gets rehearsed again in Down and Out in Paris and London, in George Orwell's wonderful work, where those same um, ideas get replayed. Um, and so what's quite interesting is the way in which then Schofield tries to represent a domesticated figure who might fit then into an idea of respectability explicitly by kind of excluding these others. Now what I think is interesting, I mean I've talked about the 1950s and 1960s, but what's really interesting is the way in which some of these ideas endure, maybe less explicitly 
um, but no less perhaps perniciously. So um, the Gay Liberation Front in the early 1970s famously tried to um, look at an idea of social and sexual revolution, trying to look across um, prejudice and tried to align with feminist and anti-racist um, um, protest and radicalism um, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a drive for social change. But what's really interesting is the extent to which that um, grouping developed as almost exclusively white and almost exclusively middle class, especially in some of the squatting communities that emerged in the mid to late um, 70s. And what's really interesting, in uh, all and I did an oral history project on a group of squatters in Brixton in South London, then in the 70s, uh, as now, a, a large, uh, with a large um, Afro-Caribbean population, immigrant population. And the squats, which involved between 60 and 80 people, were almost exclusively, well, were exclusively white, except for two very short-term visitors from Portugal, for the whole 10 years of their existence. And they were also largely middle class. And it was really interesting interviewing those men now, and they were kind of really interestingly reflective and self-critical about the unwitting exclusions um, that occurred in the way they set up um, those squats, and in what one described as their rudeness um, to the working class squatters down the road, um, and to some of the Afro-Caribbean queers who had their own um, circuit in Brixton. Subsequent to that, I did some work on um, representations of gay parenting, kind of in the light, I suppose, of the ado recent adoption legislation. Um, and I tracked um, representations of gay and lesbian parents from um, the 1970s in the popular press and in um, um, the mag magazine press. What was kind of shocking, actually, is the extent to which these ideas continue um, to, surround, to surround class. So I think with one exception, the parents that were gaining coverage were white, and they were almost exclusively middle class. And the two or three cases who weren't middle class were nurses. So there was this idea that to be a good homosexual and a good parent was very much about being white and being middle class. And I'll just show you, um, oh, here are the squatters in Brixton. This is one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> um, this is actually from an American uh, magazine. But you can see here Jason and DeMarco putting their families first, their family first, they're Christian singers, and they're the kind of guys who finish each other's sentences. As if that's a good thing, I don't know. <laughs> but what we're getting here is, and not this is 2013, but it's not so distant an echo of that image of domestic um, homosexual bliss that Scho Schofield was playing, putting forward um, in the 1950s. And it's the idea of this is the kind of family we can imagine and that we can accept. Um, and I think when we're thinking about the really great things that have happened in terms of legislation um, and shifting cultural and social attitudes is we really need to think about what might underpin and provide scaffolding for some of those changes and both who gets included and who explicitly or not gets excluded from some of these ideas of equality um, and rights. And I suppose my argument would be that we need to look very closely when we look um, um, at, 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 at homosexual queer history. We need to look very closely at misogyny, racism, and class prejudice as a vehicle for some of the changes that have come about um, in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And I'll stop there. Thank you. This touches on, on a number of themes which will interest any historian of modern Europe. And what I thought I'd do in the 10 odd minutes I have is just to focus on two of them, the marginalization of specific groups, the, the persistence of discrimination and prejudice. Um, Becky's book has an enormous reach across centuries and large stretches of the continent, but I thought I um, should take you to one very particular setting, the aftermath of the Second World War in Germany. Post-war Germany was a time and a place Post-war Germany was a time and a place when several different trajectories of discrimination and bias came together and intermingled. There was the Germans' own prejudices, um, and they met the prejudices of the Allies and those of the mass of refugees and dislocated people now in Germany. It, I suppose you can characterize Germany in 1945 for a very brief moment as a melting pot of ethnicities and nationalities, 
all living in very close proximity. And that proximity uh, seemed to have reinforced a number of long-standing preconceived ideas and prejudices about differences and about um, ethnic hierarchies. So just a, a few words about this, this setting about Germany after the war, which was a very peculiar place. Um, it was defeated, divided into occupation zones, and administered by the British, American, French, and Soviet armies. It was in a state, a state of disintegration, exhaustion, uncertainty, and uh, there was a fair amount of destructions uh, uh, as a result of bombing raids and, and advancing armies. The Allied occupiers were there to prevent the possibility of a Third, war, third World War. There was much disagreement between them, but there was also fundamental agreement on basic premises. Germany was to be demilitarized, it was to be denazified, war, crimes, war criminals were to be put on trial, and institutions were to be cleansed of anti-democratic um, uh, uh, racial theory and personnel. These chaotic conditions were exacerbated by the population chaos, which Becky has already um, touched on, the movements of millions of people the, um, uh, at precisely this time. Germany was geographically and politically at the center of this. Even by conservative estimates, there were well over 25 million people of a range of nationalities now on German soil. Um, they included prisoners of war, disbanded soldiers, newly arriving um, occupation armies, liberated inmates from the concentration camps and prisons, liberated slave laborers who had been deported to work in German factories or mines, as well as city inhabitants who had been evacuated to rural areas, and the 12 or so million uh, German expellees from the territories in, in, on the eastern and uh, south of Europe. All of them were now on the move as they tried to go home or settle somewhere new. In this context, a new category of people, the so-called displaced persons, was invented by the Allies uh, for civilian refugees outside of their home countries. Um, most of them were Polish, Italian, Ukrainian, Russian, and so on. Many of them, most of them had been slave laborers who now required repatriation. But the DP category is interesting because it contained not only the people who were clearly um, most in need of support, um, picture the, the sick and exhausted and emaciated survivors of, of the slave labor camps, but also those most deserving of it. It was, it was a status which was awarded to people who were deemed eligible, and eligibility was fiercely guarded and policed. For example, any form of collaboration with, with any of the Axis powers was to overrule claims an individual might have on the basis of nationality or citizenship. In practice, of course, this wasn't so easily applied, but this idea of deserving um, was to be crucial for the tone in which um, uh, these uh, refugees were dealt with afterwards. And it, talking about deserving encouraged discrimination of and prejudice against apparently less deserving ethnic groups. A further complicating factor was that the moral fronts, which were so very clear after the defeat of uh, Germany, changed radically within a couple of years. Soon the wartime cooperation of the Allies came under pressure by growing distrust and increasing inco increasingly incompatible political programs. And one immediate result was that the DP category changed too. Initially, it was reserved to victims of, of Nazi, Nazi racial policy. From the spring and summer of 1945, it also came to accommodate thousands of people fleeing um, Eastern European countries now under communist control. So this is all by way of background. Today, I don't want to, I don't think this is the place to talk about the Germans' own prejudices in this context. Um, Reams have been written about that. Suffice to note that in spite of this, this chaos and, and defeat and efforts to denazify and detoxify institutions, many institutions saw a remarkable degree of continuity, both in their personnel and in some of their central ideas. Here, what I wanted to do is highlight a perhaps rather more surprising source of prejudice, which was the Allies themselves. And I, I'd like to point to two sets of biases in particular. First of all, um, those uh, uh, enacted by the military and occupational authorities. The military authorities, above all, resented the DPs, um, both for presenting a drain on, on scarce resources and for the comparatively they thought disproportionate international support directed at them. On top of that, old ideas, for example, about the, the spectre of an epidemic invasion brought by the Slavs of Eastern Europe, also subtly influenced the way in which the Allied military authorities, authorities regarded the DPs. They saw them, above all, as a threat to public health and, a so, and, and social order. 
Everywhere occupation staffs begrudge them as a troublesome burden. Their reports expressed concerns about DP's rowdy or violent behaviour and pointed to their frequent association with black market activities, with local prostitutions, with um, rising venereal disease rates. In fact, if the military reports are to be believed, the DPs were out of control. They were out for revenge. They, there were episodes of shoot at them trying to shoot their former masters, ransacking food stores and farms, breaking into houses, killing policemen who tried to intervene. And even, of course, if it wasn't part of the Allies' brief to protect the Germans from such attacks, the importance of preventing DPs at least from causing more havoc than was necessary and from using up the, the resources in short supply was widely recognised. And here is a, a, a perhaps surprising thing happened, which, which was that in the army's efforts to maintain basic order and prevent vandalism, local Germans suddenly became unexpected but obvious allies. In this um, particular, uh, particularly damaging were allegations by military staffs that DPs were given more than they needed and that they thereby worsened the shortages by the Germ among the Germans. Um, officers complained regularly that a large amount of surplus foods donated by um, international charities was rotting away in warehouses designated for DP consumption. One um, US sergeant proclaimed, they're getting plenty of food, the same ration as you, but they keep stealing. Every bunk in the barracks has a box of stale bread and rotting food, and they're saving it just in case supply runs out. These people are like animals. And this is the kind of language that characterized so much of these um, authorities um, um, portrayal of DPs. And in this context, relations between occupiers and the occupied population prospered in many parts of the country. As one 21-year-old um, GI stationed in Bavaria remembered, he, like his fellow soldiers, actually had come to like the Germans. Um, they were cleaner, they were friendlier, they were more trustworthy than, for example, the French they had known during the war. The Germans actually had made good soldiers and they would make good civilians. So Germans seemed preferable to the mass of bedraggled uh, humanity of varying skin colours, ethnicities, nationalities and apparently levels of civilization. In their love of the Germans and their hatred of the DPs, the occupation authorities unwittingly drew on and repackaged much older preconceptions of the opera-loving, cultured, scientifically and economically advanced German nation, even though it had just been defeated in a bloody war, on one hand, and the backward, troublesome, lazy, dirty, southern and eastern Europeans on the other. So this is one group of, of prejudices, one set of prejudices I, I wanted to um, introduce you to. Another, a second, concerns that by the relief workers who were organizing the re refugee camps, who had their very own preconceptions and prejudices. They, like the refugees themselves, were of many nationalities, but particularly numerous were the British, American, Canadian and Australians, but there were also a fair number of Belgians, Dutch and French, among others. And here it was not so much a problem of sympathising with the Germans, quite to the contrary, they saw their job as standing up for the DPs who had few or no advocates, making their case heard and finding them a way to return home. They frequently called for a greater appreciation of and, and sensitivity to cultural peculiarities of Southern and Eastern European DPs by the British and Americans in particular. And they urged the military authorities to look beyond their obviously poor outward impression. Let me quote from one um, uh, uh, man called C. Jack from the DP headquarters. He said, through no fault of his own, the DPs made such a bad impression. His home is usually a barracks, a schoolhouse, a barn. His wardrobe is usually what he wears, plus a few pieces of clothing stuffed in a bag. He has developed a defensive attitude as protection against German brutality and he has learned to distrust promises and pieces of paper. His world obviously revolves around food and shelter. In American slang, he looks and acts like a bum. And in contrast, the Germans are well-dressed, better fed and living at home and are very correct in their manner when they're addressing American officers. So the relief workers were in many ways very sympathetic to the DPs and tried to argue their case. But even these individuals who had come specifically to assist the victims of Nazism and fascism had clear racial and ethnic hi hierarchies and often quite unselfconsciously so. As they entered the, the war-wrecked field, their instructions were to set up camps to gather the refugees and um, uh, to group them uh, according to nationality and where possible to even house the nationality in different barracks. They were then to elect or appoint their national representatives with whom they could then discuss the, the needs and allocations and the various travel arrangements home. 
But in practice, national leaders were not elected generally, but chosen by the relief workers because they could speak English and because they seemed most amenable to work with the Allied authorities. So the very first biases were in favour of those people with whom they could work, those who followed instructions, who engaged with the de developments, who had initiative um, and, and seemed to take an interest in, in developments around them. And over the coming months and years, relief workers, when comparing the different nationalities of, of refugees under their care, tended to agree that those from the Baltic states were the most cultured. They were white, they were clean, they were civilized, they were eager to learn English, and they wanted to do things the Anglo-American way. Conversely, the Russian DPs were universally disliked. They had a reputation to lack basic hygiene, they um, uh, were so, so apparently undisciplined and had no motivation to work. In practically every account I've come across, um, there are anecdotes of Russians stealing or brewing industrial strength alcohol and, and drinking themselves to death. Apart from the Russians, the Greeks, some of the Jewish DPs, and of course the Sinti and Roma were also disliked as lethargic, as unwilling to work or clean up after themselves. And some, some of the more sympathetic among the relief workers interpreted this behavior as a return to infantilism and as a form of revenge on a society which had clearly um, hounded them and, and brutally mistreated them. But there are actually only very few of the relief workers who ventured into any kind of anal um, analysis of their aversions. And importantly, this ranking of the, the good um, and better DPs over the, the rest had important repercussions for their future lives. One British director of a, of a model DP camp explained in an interview in, in 1947, Estonians would make first-class citizens of any country. The Bolts, he concluded, were the pick of the volunteer la labor force which Br Britain could have. They were clean, efficient, cultured, and hardworking. They had already proved themselves capable of living together in a miniature United Nations. And of course, the reverse of that was that the old, the sick, and the apparently less civilized hardcore of the non-repatriable DPs were left behind. It's interesting that the voices of the DPs themselves are much harder to find in the in the records. And Becky, in, in her book, talks about the absence of the GPs from the from the records. And partly that's a problem here too. States claimed their citizens and counted. I'll be back. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just need to go out. States claimed their citizens and counted, registered, and took charge of their nationals uh, among the DPs. But those without a state. Um, immediately fell into bureaucratic holes and had no immediate outlet to write and publish their stories or be heard in the same way that members of the well-organized NAFTA groups were. So reading Becky's book in a way makes me keen to, to take a closer look at the, at the gypsies among the DPs. Research I've done today certainly suggests that within the camp environment, the encounter of the different national groups mobilized a series of, of long-standing biases and preconceptions about national characteristics and mentalities. And of course, all of this is strengthened by the fact that this was the era of a, of a belief in national characters, national mental characters. Um, Gypsy was often stamped onto the DP ID card, whereas other nationalities were not. So these classifications were, were real, they were not very subtle. So just to um, uh, conclude, the marginalization and typecasting of ethnic groups in post-war Germany and this peculiar setup of occupied um, Germany drew on long-standing traditions and more or less explicitly articulated preconceptions and prejudices. And continuities across big rifts and disjunctures, such as the defeat and occupation of, of the country, abounded. Um, this pervasiveness of discrimination, I think, makes it all the more important to study systematically the roots and various forms and context of uh, prejudices, which is exactly what Becky Taylor has done.